And so the surgeon can get direct feedback. Oops, you know, there's an area of the brain, of course, we don't say oops in the operating room, <laughs> but uh, an area of the brain where, you know, we shouldn't be in, so you back out of that area. All right, what is this? An episode from episode of ER. Yeah, it looks, uh, looks like brain surgery, oh. right? And I never watched the show. Yeah, uh... I have, actually. Have you? Yeah. I'm not oh, big on medical okay. drama. House. I like house. That was, that was before, uh, <laughs> before I got into medicine. Okay, so what we're seeing is, so a couple okay. of things here. Let me, uh, let me just stop it. So uh, what we're seeing is that, that this patient is uh, having brain surgery, presumably for the removal of a brain tumor because it's an awake brain surgery. Mm-hmm. So he's, uh, he's awake and there is a neurology team on one side that's showing him pictures and, and trying to keep him naming objects mm-hmm. while their surgeon, the surgeon is stimulating uh, on the brain side. This is not an uncommon way to remove tumors that are uh, close to an area of the brain that's functional mm-hmm. and we want to see a response. Now, it's mostly um, happening in cases where you have um, speech involved because of course speech is no good way to electrically map when a patient is asleep and so um, you'll see um, um, you know these cases where the patient is seemingly able to communicate and is awake uh, and they're able to do that now how do you get of course you see here the brain is already open the skull is removed right how do you get there with yeah. somebody fully and awake? how does this differ from what actually takes place right 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 but the the real question is how do you get a patient like that and have them awake right yeah um and under anesthesia and under anesthesia and do surgery of course drill the skull and all that so yeah. so the key is to understand that you don't get to this point of testing uh with the patient fully awake the whole time so what happens is you put the patient into a, a more deeper state of anesthesia mm-hmm. without necessarily using a breathing tube oh okay uh but they're completely out and that allows you um so that's to, pretty dangerous uh it, it i mean is, risky not dangerous. it is risky yeah. and it involves uh special anesthesia knowledge and it takes a special anesthesiologist of course but what's key here is that uh when it when there comes time to do the mapping, you need to have the patient immerse from whatever anesthesia they're on. So you really need to be a skilled anesthesiologist because otherwise you, the whole team will be sitting there, the patient fully asleep, waiting for the patient to wake up. And so everything needs to be timed perfectly. You need to be doing a lot of these procedures. And right off the bat, a thing that I noticed here is that the patient seems to have a breathing tube through their nose. Um, that That really wouldn't wouldn't be the case if Mm -hmm. you have a breathing tube through your nose that breathing tube has to go in down through the trachea so nasal intubation doesn't mean that you still are able to talk most of the times this goes through your vocal cords into your lungs and therefore you wouldn't be able to talk so you'd be choking on the tube (laughs) so so this is not really realistic but i I appreciate the uh the sentiment and the uh the effort here so i guess i did a good job of you know they just started with the brains already open right here we are we're doing the testing so this they skip the gore details of course yeah and so so what they're doing is they're showing him images of animals and uh or objects i would say in this case an elephant and uh, you see um you see the physician what he's doing is he's indicating with his finger when to stimulate and when to hold stimulation and you see they're talking about how many milliamps they're stimulating with uh and um i'm gonna stop it right here um you know what, what what's happening is that of course you don't want to indicate to the patient that you're stimulating because sometimes that can have a placebo effect and the patient might not be able to produce the words mm. because they think that they feel the stimulation, right? So you're indicating with your finger in this case, there's, you know, hand signals, whatever signals you have with your team to indicate that, hey, listen, I'm stimulating so that the neurologist that's sitting on the other end and is showing the pictures to the patient understands that if there's hesitation, if there is what we call paraphrasic errors. So, you know, for example, instead of saying a chair, you can say the sitter. Because that's where you sit, you know what I mean? So yeah. you can change the words if you're doing, if you're making mistakes or if, if you're changing the way you speak or, um, you know, the neurologist can perceive all that and give a signal to the surgeon as uh, we'll see. And you see kind of how this, th- actually the the probe that you stimulate with is very accurately depicted on the, on okay. the screen. And of course, this, as you see cameras all over the operating room and this is projected so that everybody can see. And you see the surgeon, the neurosurgeon, and the neurologist are communicating with uh, 
with eye signals for the most part. You know, you're trying to you're trying to minimize uh, a verbal communication because, of course, you don't want the patient to to understand. Uh, and and you see kind of how here they're getting into a little bit of hesitation. Uh, they're going back and forth, and uh, I'm gonna stop it right here. Another thing they do is, uh, and, and of course they didn't show it here because it's not as sensational, but at some point they, they wanna look at threshold or to what point they would get stimulation or they would get a response, uh, and to what point they'll have the brain start getting too excited. Because of course you're delivering an electrical impulse to the brain, naturally you can short circuit the brain and cause a seizure, right? And so they would do all that at the beginning, but that's a very realistic um, scenario where they're going up on the stimulus to try to see if, and why do they do that, right? Because they're trying to map the brain. They're trying to see what is my path through the brain to the tumor, mm -hmm. right? So you don't want to, um, you want to make sure that the areas that you're stimulated are not causing any speech problems so that if you cut in those areas, you're not going to cause a speech uh, deficit in the end. And so this is what's going on here. And this is actually one of the doctors from the show that's being operated on. Right, I right, right. It. Yeah. It's an emergency room doctor. Uh, and so, yeah, so, so he's continuing to, and here, you know, the signs of trouble, he's hesitating a lot and he's starting to shake, which is, of course, uh, 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 a seizure. You know, like I said, you know, the brain gets short-circuited and folks start to seize. Now, how do you deal with a seizure in these cases? Normal. Now his life's flashing before his eyes. Right. So I mean, I, I don't know how serious this is, but... <laughs> no, and, and of course, you know, they, 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 this is TV and they're trying to be sensational here. And during the seizure, they're trying to um, they're trying to show something else other than the seizure. Yeah. But what happens is, of course, if somebody gets into a, a, general, a generalized seizure or a partial seizure, you can have a, what we call a post-ictal period after the seizure where you, you don't really participate. Mm -hmm. And that can be detrimental to a surgery, of course. Uh, and so you want to avoid that. One of the first tools that you have in your disposal to try to stop the seizure is cold saline. So we have ice cold, it looks like a slushing mach machine, honestly. Okay. In the operating room, ice cold saline. And immediately when this happens, you um, uh, irrigate the brain with cold saline and you try to calm down the electrical activity, right? They just let him recover on very, his own, it seems. Very important. I think they were doing it, actually. I saw the surgeon say, where is the cold saline? So okay. they're definitely, they're definitely okay. very accurate on that. I must say, they're, they're kind of spot on on all issues. Uh, and and uh, I also want to make a comment on that. You see the tools that they have. You see the clamp on his head. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a Mayfield head holder. They've been very accurate, very on point in all the tools that we have in the operating room. I mean, kudos to them. This is this is uh, really well done. Well, this is ER. This was this, this was on forever. Right. So right, I guess right. that's how because they were pretty accurate and listened to their They're spot on. And you know, you see he's wearing his glasses. This is a. a an actor and a character that wore glasses throughout the show. So, you know, he's wearing his glasses, which is what we would do in the operating room. We'd give you your glasses, because obviously if you're not seeing, you're not going to be able to produce the terms, right? Other than the breathing tube, I think everything else is pretty, pretty uh, on point. Um, and um, so, so you know, you'll see the, the microscope is actually the microscope we would use in the operating room. And uh, here's what the surgeon says, you know, we, he hasn't recovered much from the seizure. What should we do? You know, should we stop and, and come back later? And that's, although it sounds crazy and you see his wife is like, you opened his skull. Yeah. That's a very realistic thing. You know, if, if somebody's out of it, you, you're not going to keep somebody, somebody's head open for hours and hours and hours, risking infection, risking a million other issues, mm -hmm. um, and then not be able to resect the tumor or, or the yeah. patient gets so tired and then everything is hesitation. Everything. And so you get false information. You cannot resect the tumor. So you you got to, it's kind of this fine tuning uh, effect. Also, you cannot give a lot of anti-seizure medications, a lot of anesthesia. Normally, if you do brain surgery and somebody's asleep, right? And while you're operating, they're having a seizure. You give more anesthesia, mm -hmm. that seizure stops. Uh, you cannot really do that very aggressively. Of course, you can give medications mm -hmm. with that risk. Uh, but But... Most of the times when we have a grand mal or a generalized seizure, we would probably stop the surgery, honestly. But in this case, of course, um, he seems to be making a, a substantial recovery and uh, he, uh, he starts talking and, of course, the surgeon talks back to him. And so that's another thing, you know, uh, people often ask, you know, do you talk to the patients during open brain surgery? Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. you can communicate with them. You know, they give you feedback. 
They love to hear the voice of their surgeon. They built that confidence that led them to the operating room. They want to know that uh, somebody, you know, with a steady hand is over their head and communicates with them. And that's one of the most important things you can do. Imagine being a patient in that setting. How scary would it be, right? Well, we see even with our patients when they start coming out of the angiogram, which is a moderate sedation. Right. You know, they're like, uh, you know, Dr. Beckerless, what's going on? Right. And you're right there talking to them, letting them know. You, you have to. They right? might not remember everything, right. but they're looking for you. Right. And, and a lot of folks don't remember this, uh, this um, uh, experience, right? When they're uh, having a wake brain and surgery. Anesthesia is pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> because, you know, they, they're able to communicate, they're able to, to do stuff, but, but often they might not remember much of what happened during the procedure. Uh, and you see kind of how he's covered with drapes. Mm -hmm. That's also very, very realistic because you you have all the sterile drapes sterile, for the yeah. surgeon on the top side and, you know, you have to tent the drapes up the same way they've done it here. So this is actually, I would say, A plus for uh, the production team. And so he says, you know, I want to keep going. They check on things and then... So how know, realistic is that where you're just taking the patients like, okay, he wants to keep doing it, let's do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can you can actually ask them if they're tired. Um, and, and it's not so much that they're saying, let's keep going. It's the fact that they're fluent the way they're mm -hmm. talking, which is important for them. You know, they need to be fluent. They need to be able to do these tests. Because as you'll see, kind of let me restart it. As uh, you'll see what's now, going Mark, on here is that, that begin um, with B. the neurologist is asking him to say uh. words that start with the letter B. Mm -hmm. And of course, that allows the patient to constantly talk, right? And think of these words while the surgeon, you see, um, has a, a, a retractor and a bipolar, very accurate. And they're uh, removing the brain tumor there. And, and so, you know, when you do, when you do these maneuvers, on the brain, so you did the mapping initially, you found your corridor into the brain, then you proceed to take the tumor out while the patient keeps talking. So how would you be able to take, remove the tumor? Because you know, we just see them pull it right out. Right. How do you get to that point that we so, didn't see? So you saw he's holding what we call a bipolar on one hand, which is cautery, uh, and that allows him to burn the tissue around the tumor to mm -hmm. prevent bleeding from that tissue. Uh, and also he's using a retractor to develop the plane where the tumor is and eventually take it out. It's typically a suction tool and a bipolar to, to be able to, to parse out the tumor from the normal brain. Um, and since you have the mapping, sometimes you get to map also while you're operating because you get deeper into the brain. Mm -hmm. Of course, you map the surface before, but then you get to go deeper into the brain and you get to map again and continue that process. But it's certainly very important for the patient during their section to be constantly talking and that's why they're switching from images to say words that begin with the letter B so that there's no interruption. And so the surgeon can get direct feedback. Oops, you know, there's an area of the brain, of course, we don't say oops in the operating room, <laughs> but uh, an area of the brain where, you know, we shouldn't be in, so you back out of that area. And so all in all, let's say great video, you know, great representation, very respectful, of course, to the patient and everything else uh, on a topic that uh, a lot of patients are fascinated with. Yeah. Honestly, a very challenging surgery, not because of the technical aspect of the surgery, but more, of so, more so of managing the patient, the patient's emotions, um, having multiple teams in the operating room, having that ability to communicate and get information on the fly. Very challenging from an anesthesia perspective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from a surgical perspective, it's the same as a sleep. It's not that different, but um, really, really uh, challenging and, and great job uh, bringing it on TV and uh, kind of demonstrating how that function works and very, very accurate with the electrophysiology, neurology, uh, the operating room equipment. I'd say A plus. Oh, good job. All right.